Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I will talk about transport and climate change. And you see my first thesis, we cannot, stay, uh, we cannot stop climate change without changing our mobility. And then I have a second thesis, mobility is too cheap in Europe. The environmentally friendly mode of transport is very expensive. Is, uh, and this is due to political will. And the third thesis, the EU is part of the solution. Fair competition across transport modes would enable sustainable transport modes to exploit their competitiveness. The EU targets for 2020, 20% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, 20% of energy from renewable resources, and 20% improvement of energy efficiency. This goal can be reached, but we all, all the member states and the European Union, need to do the wrong thing. The situation now, we have an increase of CO2 emissions, and we have a modal shift in the wrong direction. Share of air and road transport is increasing, share of rail and waterways is decreasing. And we have an unfair competition between the different modes of transport. Transport planning with the wrong priorities. They think big instead of act smart and quickly. The CO2 emissions by the sector. You can see that transport is responsible for nearly 30% of all the CO2 emissions in Europe. After the industry, it's the highest sector. That is bad, but if you look at the transport sector itself, more than 70% is done on the road. So we have to change mobility in order to fight against climate change. All that is very, very bad. But what is worse, if you look what we have done since 1990, you can see that the emissions in industry are decreasing by 34%, in the energy sector by 17%, and in the housing by 14%. And in the same period of time, the transport sector has increased the emissions by 29%. So you can say, all what we have done in other sectors, with billions of euros of our taxpayers, is nothing if transport is ignored. For example, in Germany, they want now 5 billion euros for housings. That is fine. But if they don't do anything in transport, it doesn't matter. The situation, if you look cars per thousand inhabitants in, in the United States, 800 cars per thousand inhabitants, everybody who is able, who is able to drive a car has statistically a car. But in the United States, you find households with five persons with no car, or households with two persons with five cars. Germany has 600. The European Union average is 450. But if you look at Berlin, my hometown where I come from, we have 300 cars for 1,000 inhabitants. That is a wonderful figure. But what do the Senate, the government in Berlin do? They are now building an highway which was planned in the 50s when the car-oriented city was, was the goal. And then it is with 150 kilometers per kilometer, uh, 150 million euros per kilometer, the highest price for highways in Germany and in Berlin. And we do need different things. And if you look at China, Two years ago, there were 17 cars. Now you have 40 cars. It's a very small figure. But if the Chinese would drive a car half as much as we do in Europe, tomorrow nobody will drive a car. There's no oil, no steel, nothing. And we can't come with a big Mercedes to China and say, oh, oh, don't drive a car. That is very very uh, badly for the climate. We have to be a good example to show them we can be mobile without a car. And that is a possibility for the future. 
We have a mandatory rail charge. Each locomotive in Europe has to have a charge on each kilometer, independent if they are transporting freight or passengers. You see that it's very different. There is no limitation. In Estonia, with uh, rail freight, is very, very high, and others low. If you compare that with the road charge, that is the free will of the member states if they have a road charge. And in Germany, for example, it is only on highways and some other roads, and only for trucks more than 12 tons. And it is limited. In Switzerland, for example, they have a road charge for each truck more than 3.5 tons and on each road. So they have not a change from big trucks to smaller trucks or from highways to normal roads. It is four times higher than in Germany. But therefore it is limitation that Austria can't have a charge like in Switzerland. So that is a unfair competition. And if you look at the, at the costs in Switzerland, for the consumer, the price has increased by 0.5%. Why? Because they know it is very expensive, so there is not a big truck for 10 uh, packages of wine 300 kilometers through, through Switzerland. So they ask their competitor, do you have space in your truck? And next morning, he will be called for another one, do you have... And so there's a better coordination and the empty lorries has going down. That is Switzerland. They are wonderful for Europe, but they are not member of the European Union, perhaps, therefore they can be so European. <clears throat> we have a tax disadvantages. If I go from Berlin to Brussels by train, it lasts three times longer. The price is three times higher and the state takes 90% value added tax. If I take the plane, the state says, no, no, no. The emissions there are three or four times higher than on the ground. I don't like the money. To, be, to fly must be very, very low prices. And that is the reality. You see, Germany is leading with 19% than are others, but in Greece that is not a problem because they have stopped all the trains to the, neighbors, to the neighbor states. There is no train now, but you see all the others have zero. And that is unfair. The kerosene tax is a subsidy 14 billion euros. Value added tax, a kerosene tax, they are free, the airlines. If I take a train, diesel they have to pay, if they have uh, uh, power they have to pay. There is not an integration in the EU, EU emission trading system. And if it would be reality, 85% of all the certificates would be given to the airlines for free. Only 15% there would be an option. There is no charges on corridor. There is an exception via Siberia. All are complaining about that. But we could say to the Russian, OK, what you can do, we can do it as well. No. No charge in the air. And of course, the delay, reimbursement of three hours. With the railways, you get after one hour of reimbursement. So all that is unfair. And I can quote a Christian Democrat in Germany, Johannes Ludwig. He was state secretary in the economy when there was a reunification of Europe. And he told me in the transport sector, the market economy is not. And I asked him, oh, do you think that is a planning economy, which, which in the, the eastern part of Europe we have overcome? Then he said, yes, that is it. So in the transport sector, we have an unfair competition in favor of those modes of transport which are harmful to the climate. Maritime transport, we have navigation, we have no fuel tax taxation, we have no charges, and of course we have heavy investments but low capacity because 80% of all the Freight transport on inland waterways in Europe is on the Rhine. A long river, a deep river, a wide river with connecting the ocean. But they are dreaming of the Danube. 
And I was 30 years ago, I went by, a, by kayak from Ingolstadt to the Black Sea. Every 10 minutes we have to, to turn our boat because of the big waves of the ships. Last year, I was 100 kilometers by bike on the Danube and I saw three ships on the Danube a day. But they are thinking Romania, Serbia, Czech in the, in the Elbe and other rivers, they are thinking of all this. But we have to concentrate what is necessary. And if you look on the maritime transport, maritime, the big ships, they are Hazardous waste incendiaries without filters. Why? They are using the heavy oil. The heavy oil is a waste product, a very, very uh, hazardous waste product of the raw oil production. And they are blowing it in the wind. And it comes then to Europe as well. So also there, there must be a, a limitation of the emissions. And on the inland waterways, the ships have to be adapted to the rivers and not the rivers adapted to the big ships. So, the EU Commission, that the white paper on transport, 2030, a reduction by 20%, comparing to 2008, and in 2050, 60% compared to 1990. It is easy to make steps in centuries or in decades when nobody of us is living here. But the first step is important, and that must be short. And so the European Parliament has decided to 2020, 20% reduction comparing to 1990. That is if we can't afford the first step, we never will make the second one. How does this relate to urban mobility? Facts on urban mobility. By 2050, 84% of all the EU population will live in cities. And in the cities, transport is responsible for 40% of all the CO2 emissions. But the CO2 emissions are not the only one which are harmful to the climate. If I look at all the emissions in, in cities of Europe, 70% of the emissions are done by transport. So it is necessary but in the cities, we have a big chance to change mobility. Most trips start and end in cities. And of course, by 2060, 30% of all EU citizens will be closer than 60 years, will be long, uh, older than 60 years. Today, it's only 17. So there is a big chance. And I can give you a figure from our transport minister in Germany, Peter Ramsauer. He's a very conservative person who nearly only looks through the window screens of cars. But he told me 90% of all the distances made by cars in German cities is shorter than six kilometers. 90% shorter than six kilometers. A big chance to change mobility, to bus, to train, to bicycle, to go by foot. If you look Atlanta, Barcelona. Barcelona has 2.8 million inhabitants. Atlanta, 2.6 or 5. <clears throat> but the area is 26 times larger than of Barcelona. Which way we want to the future? This way, car-oriented city, or the shorter ways of city of Barcelona? And that is a European way. And that we have to look also for the future. Speed limit 30. It's a big discussion now because there is a European initiative for speed limit 30. I come from Berlin. More than 20 years ago, it was a red-green government, has made speed limit 30 on nearly 80% of the roads. But now 80% have been signposted. That is very expensive. And if we change it, we say, OK, we have the normal speed is 30, and the cities can decide on which road we drive 50. Then, OK, we only need 20% to be signposted in a new way. And that is 
of course important and we had a decision by the European Parliament that strongly recommends for cities to have a speed limit mandatory 30 of course with exceptions. Why is it so important? The braking distance is going from 28 meters to 13 meters. And the fatality with the crash of a passenger or of a bicyclist with a car is with speed limit 30 is 10% that you will be killed. With, with 50, it is 80% if you will be killed. So 42% of the accidents would be avoided and the emissions will be going down by 12% and the noise 3 dBr that is feeling of half of the noise and of course we know noise is a big problem so this speed limit 30 is the easiest way to save the climate to save the lives and for the car drivers nearly nothing will be changed for example in Berlin I always say if we have mandatory 30 with the exception then you will not find in a road where it is allowed to drive 50, you will not find a car driver who is driving 30 and he is saying to you, oh, I didn't see the sign. That is the only difference, but we haven't it. But the parliament with a big majority have made it. We have this European Citizens Initiative and there are cities which have done it. For example, Graz or Pontevedra in Spain, nobody expected. that. They have speed limit 30 in all the area. <clears throat> and New York City, if I would have told you 10 years ago the Broadway would be a passenger area, you would have said this guy is crazy. But they did it. Now New York City is New York City. So there is a big change worldwide. Bicycles is an alternative. If you look, Copenhagen, in 20 years, they have increased the bicycle riding by 300%. Now Denmark and Netherlands are on top in Europe. More than 30% are going by bike. Then Finland, Germany and Belgium are on the same level. Interesting is Belgium. I always say Belgium is divided in unity since more than 180 years. And you can see that. The Flemish people in Belgium, they are riding as often as the Netherlands do, and the Wallonish people are lighting not so often like the French do. And on an average, they have the German average. <coughs> the figures I told you, 90% of the trips by car are shorter than 6 km, 30% short, shorter than 3, and 10% are shorter than 1 km. If I go by foot, I'm quicker, because I need to open my car, and so on and so on. Uh, I can give you an example because I have friends in, in, in Berlin with a car, but it is seldom that we can meet. Why? When I was in Berlin, I had to take the bicycle to, uh, to the parliament, and instead of going by public transport, I need my, my bicycle only uh, instead of 45 minutes, 60 minutes. And my friends, they are driving half an hour to the fitness center. I never have been there. Then they are looking half an hour for a parking space, then are jumping half an hour in the fitness center, and half an hour they are going back. The difference per week, four times they do that and me on bike, is nine hours. So it is clear, we have no time to meet. <laughs> more cyclists, more safety. We have the discussion of helmet and vests and so on. We know, for example, in the Netherlands only 0.1% of the, uh, the more cyclists you have, it is uh, secure. In the Netherlands, 0.1% wear a helmet. In the United States, 38%. But in Netherlands, we have lower accidents and lower kill people on the bike than in the United States. Because we need a lot of bicyclists on the road, then everybody knows, okay, and then the car driver is going to the right, he looks if there is a bicyclist. And that is important, so we have to encourage people to use their bicycle and don't say, oh, oh it is so dangerous, wear a helmet, wear a waist, and so on and so on. That is a big discussion we have. 
And when there was the mandatory helmet in Australia, uh, the number of bicycle riders, riders was going down and the accidents are going up. So that can be, in an individual case, it can be better, but in an average, you have to look at it. And so it must be free. And if you go 200 meters to the next shop and you need your helmet and so on, and you have to lock your bike and so on, that is a big problem. The money in Europe. We have a co-financing for transport. And we have made an analysis where the money going. 60% is going to road, 20% is going to rail, and 0.7% is going to bicycle infrastructure. The last figure I don't tell you because it is so small, but it is possible. But it's up to the cities, the regions, to the countries to ask for European money for bicycle infrastructure. And we, there is a study in Finland, in Helsinki, they have made that for each euro you have invested in bicycle infrastructure, you will get eight euros back. Because, for example, bicycle riders are only one third of them are as much ill than no, not bicycle riders. And of course, if you have more bicycles, you can ride us on the road, you have less car, and you save money for constructing road, roads, and so on and so on. Hungary has 2%. And we made an initiative in the parliament for the money that 40% at least go for rail, 20% maximum for road, and 15% at least for hiking and biking. For the first figure, we get a majority in the parliament, 40% for rail, because the European Parliament is very rail friendly. But for the others, we didn't get a majority, but I'd say not now, but I hope for the future. And then we have wrong priorities, also in the rail sector. Big projects. We have the Brenner Base Tunnel, Lyon Turin Tunnel, Fema Bell Tunnel, Coron Tunnel, Zemmering Tunnel, Stuttgart 21. All that are projects which, which will be finished in 30 years or 40 years. I wish you all a long life, but I think the Brenner Base Tunnel or Lyon Turin, we can't go there. So, but all the money is going there. But what we need, those investments which are very efficient in a short time. And for example, if you look on the railway network all over Europe, in 30 years we are building and want to construct a European railway area. But it is, it is with lots of gaps, and the gaps are exact there where the borders are. So we have to concentrate the cross-border sections. That is important. For example, uh, we have one thing between Germany and Czech Republic, 660 meters are needing to connect these issues. But since 25 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, they are not possible to do that. Between Berlin and Czechin, we have 30 kilometers of electrification is missing. Between, or uh, to Wroclaw or Breslau, the Polish have done an upgrading and electrification until the border. The Germans only did it until Cottbus. So 50 kilometers are, needing, are, are missing. So we need today five hours to go from Berlin to Wroclaw. Before the war, we needed two and a half hours. So that is the situation. Therefore, we have to concentrate on that what is in a short time you can realize and not on the long run. If we want to change from road to rail, and everybody is talking about that, we must start with smaller projects, and the big projects that must be at the end, not at the beginning, because then for other things we have no money. And because I come from, from Germany and Stuttgart 21, for 10 billion euros, there we build a new station, which is half as good as the, 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 the existing one, and for Stuttgart-Ulm, because it is so steep, the old one, we build a new one, but the new one is steeper. So the corridor Paris-Bratislava 
is not necessary, is not usable for freight transport. And because 70% of the passengers are moving or entering the, tra the, ra the trail in Stuttgart, this corridor is only economically feasible if there is freight transport. And they don't do that. And the European Commission is co-financing this disaster, I can tell you, with 400 Euro million euros. And with this money, all the connection between Germany and Poland, you can finance all together, not co-financing all. And that is a big, <clears throat> I can't explain this. Or Lyon Turin, the ministers, the, the presidents of uh, Italy and, uh, and um, uh, France came together and said, no, no, we want that because 40% will be paid by the European Union. But we haven't the money. That is clear. That is a project that is for the building industry, for the banks, is it interesting, but not that has not an effect on, uh, on transport. And that we have to change. If you are interested in European information, in European transport policy, I have a newsletter once a month, but it is only in Germany. And otherwise, you look on my website, and I thank you very much for the attention. <coughs> So, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Michal Kama. I, as someone who has been living in Berlin for the past uh, 20 years, I, I can appreciate some of the references that you've made. Um, you uh, covered quite a bit of territory in your in your presentation, uh, going over uh, emission targets, tax schemes, speed limits, safety, urban mobility, active mobility and use of uh, EU transport funding, some of the challenges associated with, with all of those. I'd like to open up the, the floor to questions. If, uh, if anyone has, uh, has some questions that they would like to direct to Michael Kama, he is willing to, to answer them. Yes, here's a question in the front uh, here, and a microphone is on its way. Uh, yeah. I'm Ioana Ramesco from uh, DG Research and Innovation, uh, the Project Officer of, of Optimism. Uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation that uh, uh, points out some of the major challenges we have ahead. Um, my question relates to the 30 kilometers limitation in urban areas. Uh, what do you think it would be the impact on congestion? Thank you. Oh, the average... Uh the average in Berlin is 19 kilometers, the average for car drivers. And of course, we know if you are riding, if you are driving more, it is not, the average is crucial. And that is not the problem. That is not the problem. And we have 80%, we have already 30%. We have a speed limit 30. And in all the German cities, more than 50% of all the roads are already speed limit 30. And so you save money and you, of course, you have more attraction and acceptance if it is mandatory. There are also the exceptions. Never I will say, okay, a highway in a, in a city must be speed limit 30 or a big road. Yeah? But it's, oh, there will not be a big change for the car drivers. But to save 42% of people of accident, to reduce accidents with this, cheaper it isn't possible, and quicker as well. Gentleman in the back in the red shirt. Uh, Carol Focus, University of Oxford. Thank you, uh, great presentation. It occurs to me that a lot of uh, European Union funded research has been recently going about travel behavior and even much more about uh, technology and improvements in technology. Yet one of the problems, as also we can see with the optimism project is that uh, the advancement or the targets, especially in terms of uh, emissions reductions that come out of these projects,
tend to be negligible, perhaps in the 1% uh, category. Do you think it would be wise, and at least would be my view, that we should move on into the research field and a lot of EU research should be funding implementation strategies? We know from tribal behavior what it is. We know how we can change it, again, from research that's been done, but what perhaps could be useful to see the European Union funding is the ways that we can actually implement this change. I'm not 100% against research, but in the transport sector, you are right. In 30 years, we know exactly what to do. Yeah? We have to stop building roads in the cities and we have to increase public transport. We have made, of course, we all know that. And the German cities, for example, Freiburg or Erlangen, which have been bicycle cities since 20, 30 years. It was the mayor in the city who said, he rode, rode his bike, he said, okay, we have to improve this. And the administration in the city said, oh, no, 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 we don't like it, but this idiot wants it, okay, we will do it. That was the situation. And today all of them are proud that they have realized it. So in transport sector, we don't need very much for innovation or for research. We need political will, political courage. All at once you will not get the benefit. But wait, one, look, Copenhagen, when they started 20 years ago, all Europe said, oh, those idiots in the northern part of Europe, I can't imagine that they will drive their bicycle. But they do that. And that are good examples and that have only been copied and then for some smaller parts, we need also research and innovation, and we have to look at it, okay, but not for the bigger ones. That is only what we need, political will. Any other questions? Um, then I, if, if I may, I, I, I would direct a question to you uh, on that very topic of, of political will. Uh, you, you began your presentation also uh, pointing that out, that there seems to be a, a, a lack of political will to a, address the, the challenges that you described. Uh, you've, during your time in, in the European Parliament, do you sense that the will may be gathering more critical mass in favor of making the changes in just tax policy, for example, that would very much affect the way transport is, is used? Uh, in my time in the European Parliament, for example, three or four years ago, when we made amendments, for example, to noise reduction, we as Greens were the only one. Or, or noise is not a problem. The French told me, no, no, we have no problems with noise on rail. Then I told them, I will go to the Rhone Valley and tell that you, that you member of the European Parliament says we have no problem with noise in France. Yeah, and now, since two years, we get a big majority for noise reduction. And the other one with the tax. Of course, I mentioned the 30 billion euros, all the European taxpayers are given to the airlines because they are free of kerosene tax and on international relation on value added tax. Imagine only 10 years, the European railways will get 30 billion euros. We would have had a wonderful European network with low prices and have reduced the aviation and that is reduced emissions by 50% and also the noise. That would be a benefit. But the political will is in the wrong direction, although on Sunday speeches they are telling us, okay, we have to save, to, to save the climate and so on. But money is going the wrong direction. Of course, it is a hard work, but uh, we will do that. Mikhail Kama, thank you very much. I'm, I think we're going to have to leave it there because we have another point on our ad agenda, and uh, that is the open space poster presentation from Optimism Consortium Key Findings and Outcomes. Mikhail Kama, Only, one more excuse point? me that I have to leave because okay. I have to go to my duties in the Parliament. Thank very you well. very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>